Hello and welcome to the Fire in the Belly show. Today we have myself, Mighty Pete, and we're joined by Russell Nolte. Good afternoon, or good morning, I should say, for you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome, awesome. Russell, tell us, who are you? What are you doing? Where are you from? I'm a USA Today bestselling author. I live in Los Angeles. I write comics and, uh, and novels, uh, mostly fantasy, but also a little bit of sci-fi and a little bit of uh, mystery as well. Wow, that's, that's very concise. You know where you are, what you're doing. It's always on top. So tell, talk to us about the comics a bit. Give us a bit of a background. Uh, so yeah, I started, I actually started uh, once I left school. So I went to school at the University of Maryland on the other side of the United States from where I live now. And I, um, I, I went to school for broadcast journalism and uh, with the hope to work in movies and TV. And then when I left school, I started making, I started shooting uh, documentaries and and uh, and all sorts of stuff and editing and, and and making my own short films and eventually I directed a, a web series called Connections which you can find on YouTube and then um, and then uh, 2000 the, the problem with that movie with movies is it takes a long time to actually get anything done and usually even when a, something is shot it takes years and years and years to edit so I've been doing it for six years professionally and i had no almost no credits for to my name because uh stuff was all still in development or it fell apart or yada 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 one thing or another so i'd moved to los angeles in 2008 and my management at the time asked me if i'd ever uh thought about doing comics and uh, i hadn't read comics in a long time uh probably since the the death and then return of superman arc back in the mid 90s uh early to mid 90s uh and uh and so i told him that i had never really thought about that he thought that my style would work really well in comics so he handed me a big stack of independent comics uh that he had uh behind him and uh, i read them all and it was off to the races from there so the first book that i made was a little ash can which is an eight page book uh sort of preview book uh, called The Wannabes, and I brought that down to San Diego Comic-Con in 2010 and was roundly rejected from all the publishers that I brought it to. Uh, I then uh, made my book that you see behind me, uh, Ichabod Jones' Monster Hunter, which is about a mental patient that escapes in a cell and then becomes a monster hunter during the apocalypse, but doesn't know if he's killing monstrous humans or it's all in his head the whole time. Uh, that happened, that, that was in production between 2000 and. 10 and 2012 before it originally came out digitally through Viper Comics and then uh, I regained the rights and put it out through my own label Wannabe Press. Um, while that was going on we also made our second book Katrina Hates the Dead or Katrina Hates Dead Shit. Um, then we followed that up with uh, a, I drew a book called Gherkin Boy and the Dollar of Destiny which I don't really talk about very much. We followed that up with our uh, our big hit was Monsters and Other Scary Shit, which is our anthology series, uh, our monster anthology series, which started with Monsters and Other Scary Shit, which uh, raised $27,000 on Kickstarter at launch. And then uh, we followed that up with Cthulhu is Hard to Spell, which you see behind me. And then Cthulhu is Hard to Spell, The Terrible Twos, which both, both raised over $30,000 on Kickstarter at launch. And then um, we followed that up with a book called Pixie Dust, uh, which was also in our Katrina Hates the Dead Gods vs. Universe. And from there, we expanded out into novels and uh, a bunch of other books. I started working with other artists for books, doing a lot of anthologies and, for other people. And, uh, and last year, we put into production the second volume of Ichabod Jones Monster Hunter, which is uh, sort of our, I guess, our flagship series now. Um, and uh, and yeah, we are just about finished production on the third volume, and the second volume is live on Kickstarter right now. Wow, no bother. <laughs> you've been there, you've done it, you've talked about it. Obviously, it, well, it, it comes across that uh, the, the production time from con conception to uh, production is, is quicker then in terms of from comparing films to comics. Is that a, is yeah, that a I mean, so um, average movie, well, you could probably get through with a movie if you worked on it full time for in like a year but it's just a lot more moving parts when i do comics it's one artist usually who does everything from sketches through final letters and then uh and with a with a movie you have actors you have uh you have camera operators you have gaffers and grips and 
and PAs and directors and producers. It's just, I mean, it's very hard to do a movie with less than 20 people. Um, I mean, you could do something like Buried uh, where, where you have very few uh, actors in it. You could do something with, you know, two, three, probably six. You know, it's a small crew is usually like 10 actors who are in, on, on set in one location. So you're talking about something like, you know, if you keep it really small, you have the director is the shooter. You probably have a, a first AD and uh, and like a couple of grips, grip electric PA type people. There's four or five people on set and a crew that's like 11, 12 people. And that's like a very, 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 very small production uh, with a comic. A, in a, a really large group would be the writer and a penciler and an inker and a colorist and a letterer and an editor, uh, maybe maybe an editorial assistant. So that's like seven people on a huge book. Uh, so, I mean, sometimes you'll get background artists and, 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 and people that are filling in the background stuff. So maybe you can get up to 10, 12 people on, on like a huge production of a book. So, and you can do a book. I mean, you can do a book by yourself. I've drawn two books now. Um, they're not very good art, but like I've drawn two. Um, I've also written 20 novels and that is really, you know, three people. So I have, when I do a novel, it's, I'm the writer and then I have an, a copy editor and I have a proofreader. So the whole, oh, and I have a cover artist. So there's four people involved in the production of the book. Um, and, 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 and really I'm doing 95% of the work because I'm, I'm doing the, 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 the writing and I'm doing the, getting the edits back and doing the edits. And then I'm getting the proofreading back and doing the proofreading. And then I'm, I'm correcting any of the, um, and, and looking for the cover design. So I'm doing most of it, uh, with a movie as a director, you're doing almost none of it, uh, is this big, sort of um, idea that like directors are these, uh, 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 I don't know, like creative gods or like they're like, they're like, uh, they're really like, like glorified production managers. Like their job, the job is mostly making, like facilitating everyone else to do their best work. By the time you get on set as a director, your job is pretty much done. Like you've, you, you've already done the shot list You've already hired the direct, you've, you've probably you've walked lo the location uh, it, and it's up to the camera operator to get the shots that you need. It's up to the actors to bring the, per, the, 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 uh, 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 the passion to their role. It's up to the production designer to get everything set, wardrobe and makeup. Like you're kind of just sitting there waiting for everyone to get done. I mean, there's work to be done because you have to go over lines, you have to go over shot lists, and you have to go over all of these things, but it's not uh, the, uh, the creative position that it's really meant out to be, uh, at least not comparatively to like uh, when you're doing a comic and you're hiring one person, you have a lot more control over what happens, especially when you're the writer. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it, it takes... I mean, you, it could take 10 years to get a movie done. Uh, when we did Connections, it, we, we shot in, I wrote it in 2006. We went to production in 2007. It was in editing to 2013. So that's seven years. Um, most times a, a, a book will take somewhere between one and two years to get done, depending on how long it is and how big the cast of, the, and how big the production is. You can go a lot faster with, if you have a different colorist, uh, colorist than letterer and inker and penciler, because then the penciler is just penciling the book, and then the, you can oh you can stack those on top of each other. Um, whereas when you have someone who's doing everything uh, from sketches all the way to final letters, it, it, it's more it's a you they have more control over what the piece is going to be, but it takes a lot longer because they have to do with the entire process. So while you may be able to get 20 pages of pencils out of someone and finish a book, like a full issue of a book in, you know, in a month, generally when you're talking about having one person do everything, you can get maybe 10 pages done in a month, which is still good. It still means you're going to have a book in eight months from the time you commission that person or probably, I always like to give, a considerable buffer, but you could definitely get a book done. And I write a novel in 
in somewhere between like in a month, I, I, I will have a book that's ready for my editor roughly every month. So it's just a whole lot quicker and, and you have more control over the process. Uh, as a director, you know, you have to negotiate locations. Um, you have to negotiate with the producer. You have to find money. You have to find the right actors. You have to make all the schedules work together. Um, you have to hope that the, the rain doesn't come. Um, you have to have backup plans for your backup plans for your backup plans in case someone gets sick or someone gets hurt. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a lot harder and more complicated uh, to do, um, to, to make a movie um, and to make a movie well. To make a, a, a bad movie is so much more complicated than you can ever imagine. Um, but to make a good movie is like, it's, it's almost a, a, as if you're creating a little miracle every time like you make a good movie because there are so many factors that can go wrong and there's so many things that can go wrong that are completely out of your control. I find that, I mean, it's fascinating there, you know, when you, when you look at the logistics of it there, do you enjoy the control process more in terms of, you know, you can be, you know, you're involved in every stage and it's actually your raw input that's happening as opposed to, I suppose, you have to divulge control for movies more so, I'd imagine. I mean, I like the collaborative process. I really love getting pages back in comics and, 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 uh, and, and seeing what someone else has done with the words that I lay out. Um, I think that it's tough because I love movies. Like, I would love to go back and, like, make and make movies and television and, and stuff again. Um, but it's just such a grueling process. And there's so much that you don't know. Like, like you're reliant on other people so much that things almost never get done. Um, unless you have, uh, unless, like, I mean, like there are so many writers that I know who are working writers who have never had a screen credit because their stuff is all done in development or their, their script doctoring work or, you know, they're, 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 they're working on something or people that have worked on 50 projects but only have three or four of them on the screen. And that's the part that I don't like. I don't like creating work and then having it not be shown to the world. So, I mean, the money's good. But at the end of their career, you know, they've got a couple of movies and maybe, you know, maybe not even that great movies to show for it. And, you know, uh, I, I, I would like to have a body of work. I, I, I'm very proud of the body of work that I've put together. I mean, you can see behind me the two stacks that I have are, are the work that I've done. And that's not even all of the work that I've done. Um, and that's just, you know, in the past decade and mostly in the past, like, four or five years. So. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm quite, I, 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 I quite like the collaborative process. What I don't like is the being stymied by, mm -hmm. um, by stuff that you cannot control, not going the way that you want. And I do not like having to rely on other people to validate the idea or allow me to make the idea because there's just like you yeah, just don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars. I do have thousands of dollars to like put into making these books and then the books come out and they, and they like make their money back, knock on wood, hopefully. No, that's great. Uh, in terms of that, so give us a, give us a run through in terms of, you know, I mean, that's quite a stack of books behind you there. And, and I'm, I'm curious also about how you've, you've found you've got into a, a I mean, it, it appears you've, you've found this flow process that you've, you've picked up speed over the last number of years, as you said, through understanding yourself or through contacts, et cetera. Uh, I'm sorry. What is the question? So the question, sorry, first of all, is in terms of give us a, give us an overview of your portfolio and, and your, you know, this is what's, what's in your, in your portfolio to date and then talk to us about your process. Sure. So, uh, well, there's the comics that I mentioned already. I kind of bring you through all of the comics. I also have a sketchbook that's on that stack. Um, and then uh, I do nonfiction books. So I have two nonfiction books, How to Build Your Creative Career and How to Become a Successful Author. Um, I've been in close uh, a dozen or so anthologies in the past, since 2017. So I try to do five or six, if I can, anthology projects a year. I have two coming out next month, one that's coming that came out this month, 
And then I had a couple come out earlier this year. So this is actually a very busy time for releasing for me because uh, there's usually there's usually one or two. Um, actually, there may be three comics uh, releasing that I've done um, next month, and then um, and then the comic that I do right now, mostly known for comics right now. Uh, I've written 20 novels. Let's see the ones that are out. Uh, I have a mystery novel called My Father Didn't Kill Himself. I have a um, grounded sci-fi called Sorry for Existing. Um, I have a, a middle grade mystery novel called um, called Gumshoes, The Case of Madison's Father. I have a children's book called um, The Little Bird and the Little Worm. Uh, then I have the uh, The Vessel which is dystopian. Um, I have uh, 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 my God's Diverse Chronicles, which is my most popular uh, series right now, uh, which is a uh, uh, mythological fantasy across like a big 13,000 um, uh, uh, a year universe, kind of like Book of Elijah or, or uh, Discworld. Uh, so that's and death followed behind me and doom followed behind. Uh, sorry, and death followed behind her and doom followed behind her and hell followed behind her and ruin followed behind her. And I've written three more novels in that series, which will be out in January. Um, and then I have uh, my summer sleigh books were worst thing in the universe, which is um, satire, um, uh, uh, marked ones, which is urban fantasy. Um, uh, invasion, which is uh, sci-fi. Void causes home, which is dark fantasy horror. Yeah, that's probably that. Those are all the ones that I can remember. And then I've mm. written. So I have, at any time, I have roughly ten things that I've written that have not come out yet. So right now I have a lot of anthology projects, something like five or six anthology projects, uh, anthology pieces that haven't come out. But then I have um, eight novels and uh, the end, uh, the Ichabod volume three is almost done. So that's nine. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then, um, and then I'm working on a 10th novel right now that I'm in the middle of. Um, and then I just hired someone to do two more books for me. So that's something around 13 books uh, that uh, are, are sort of in the can uh, at some level, either waiting for editing or, um, or ready to go. Uh, some of them need like covers or like slightly redesigned covers or have, have the covers expanded to a full wrap. But generally, you know, I have just a bunch of stuff that's in there. I like to be a year ahead of my production slate at any one time. I learned that from other publishers who generally try to stay 18 to 24 months ahead of where their production cycle is. Um, uh, it, 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 it is one of the ways that I maintain my sanity, uh, especially because I have like a very bad case of anxiety. Um, and, uh, and I mean, it's hard to, to kind of knock down my process because it sort of goes in a couple of stages. So spend about two years developing a world. Um, with something like Ichabod, it took six years to go from the first volume to the second volume. With the Gods vs. Chronicles, it took two years to go from Katrina Hates the Dead to Pixie Dust and then to start the rest of the universe. Um, with uh, I, I used to do a lot more standalones now i try to keep stuff into one or two universes because it, it's just a lot easier to get people excited to like do get another book in the same universe that they already know so um so yeah i i i, I spend about a year or two years developing i have uh books of uh, of of like notes that i've taken of like just how the process will work a lot of it is in my head um, I, I don't write a ton down before I start the actual like outlining process because I don't want to be locked down into it. But when something's new, I try to like do sketches and, 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 and I try and like try and figure out all of the pieces. My goal is 
to make a world that is expansive, that like is elastic, that I could live in for a long time, and that has different areas and access points and pockets that that uh, that 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 allow me to continue to explore it. Um, that God's Verse Chronicles is kind of a universe that I made um, by necessity because people kept asking me for more. So I did not think very hard about it before I made it. And that has made writing the books more challenging because I have to make sure not to break it in the process of making it as opposed to what I do now, which is I make sure that like, I, 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 stress test it before I ever get into the universe, which makes it a lot, uh, a lot easier to, to sit down and write. And then the writing process I, I've learned is I can get 5,000 good words out in a day. And so my goal is between nine and 10 to get a thousand words between 10 and 11 to get a thousand words between 11 and 12 to get 2000 words. And then from 12 to one to get, um, the, my last thousand words and then break for lunch between one and two. Um, sometimes it's a little bit earlier, depending on what my wife's schedule is. Cause we both work at home. Um, sometimes, sometimes it's a little bit later. If it's like, she's busy and we just missed eating together. Um, I try to walk 10,000 steps a day. Um, this is actually, uh, replacing my, um, my, my morning walk and I'll have to do two, two walks in the afternoon. Um, between two and five, and then I step back between five and seven and do some admin work. So um, I, I've cut back all of my other stuff. I used to do a lot of book marketing for other people and speaking and podcasts. And um, as 2020 has worn on, I've cut out all of the, those other things, except when I'm launching a book. So I happen to be launching a book now, which means I'm taking a lot more appearances on. But um, generally, I, I, I do have some meetings between four and six, but generally, I keep my whole day free for just writing. And it's a luxury that I've been able to put into practice this year um, that I've never had before of be, really my, my, my writing being my majority and oftentimes sole source of income. Is writing a, a pleasurable experience for you? God, no. Uh, um, it's a necessary experience. Like it's where I flush out all of my anxiety and, and fear. Um, so, so without it, I would just be a bottled nerve of neurotic mess. And I literally, when I don't write for a day or for like two or three days, I, you can really tell that I've not been writing. So it's been something that I've learned again this year that like really, uh, the rest of it is fun, is fine for making money, but like the writing is a necessity for me to like exist in the world. And the more of the writing that I do, the easier it is for me to exist in the world. So, I mean, I used to make a lot of money doing book marketing, like, and a lot of money doing speaking and selling courses and all of that stuff. And it's, it's great. It's, it's great. But like, aside from giving me money, it brought me no solace or no pleasure. Um, the writing, while I make considerably less money doing the writing uh, than I ever did, and like there's 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 so much more cost. You know, when you make a course, there's no cost. Like I, I have, I have Movavi, and like uh, and uh, and PowerPoint, and like two weeks, and I've got a course I can sell for a thousand dollars. Like it's. And, and, you know, you only need a hundred people to buy that course and you're like doing quite well for yourself. Uh, the overhead is aside from advertising, like I pay $400, I think a year for my, to host all of my courses. And uh, like the, the, the ROI is, it's insane. You know, when you make $20,000 and spend literally $400, that is not possible with books, you know, when, I, I make a comic. My comics cost twenty thousand dollars, and they're lucky to clear forty or fifty thousand dollars. So, um, and that is not inclusive of shipping and and uh, and show costs and 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 like the amount of time that I spend trying to get people to buy these things on Kickstarter. Um, so, it's way easier 
to, to, to make the courses. It's way easier to book speaking engagements or to, to get, uh, to get one-on-one -on -one clients. Um, but like it, it does nothing for me. Like it does nothing like, uh, to, to, to improve my state besides having money. Um, and my wife told me earlier this year, she's like, all you do is you take all of that money and you pour it into books. So what if you just like wrote more books and then made more money on those books instead of whatever this crazy thing that you're doing, this like, this like spending 20 hours doing book marketing and such. And then now you're spending 60 hours a week doing that because you're just still putting 40 hours a week into writing. Um, so yeah, I, 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 it's looked very good on paper for the last few years. You know, we've done over a hundred thousand dollars the last three years, uh, revenue wise. Uh, but yeah, most of that goes into books, back into books. And, uh, uh, you know, I, 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 I love, uh, I, 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 I love the friendships that I've made doing the book marketing and doing all that other stuff. But like, I can't say it's, it's, and I've learned like how to be better at marketing, but it's done nothing for me like emotionally aside from the connections that it's made. Like it's helped none of the flushing out of the anxiety and fear that I, that I experience on a daily basis. I'm curious. I mean, left to your own devices, you know, take, take all the logistics and the writing away. What, what would be your, your default go-to? What's your, what's your, what's your pleasure place? I mean, writing books, writing novels, um, I mean, writing novels is something I can do on my own and get an entire world created for myself. Um, it's the thing that I do the most. Um, I, you know, I, I generally work on, again, five or six anthology projects in a year. Um, most of those in comics and like those, those I, I write in an hour, two hours, maybe a day. It takes me to write. And, uh, and then it goes off to the, the artist and the artist is the one doing most of the heavy lifting on that. Um, and then I work on one, one comics project at a time. Usually, um, this is kind of odd because I have a book that I drew called how not to invade earth, um, that I never wrote a script for or lettered. And so I am, I am, I have somebody lettering that piece. And then also I have, uh, that same person. Uh, drawing a new book for me. So I'm technically working on two books at the same time. Um, and I have a couple of other like projects that I'm working on, but they, the artist is the one driving them forward. So like, I just kind of, when they're done with the pages, I write like the next bit, but some of them have been stalled for years. Uh, some of them, some of them, uh, you know, we've gotten 20 or 30 or 40 pages done. Um, but like, I, I never rely on those being projects that I'm like, that, that I have to release. They are going to release whenever they're available and done. You know, for instance, you know, I've, I've been working on one project for two or three years and the artist has done seven pages of the book. So like I, on that pace, I'm never going to see the end of it. So I really, it's not even in my development folder anymore. Like it's in my inactive folder and like, I never expect to like see the end of that book sorry if you're listening to this but like it's true and uh another artist came to me and was like yeah we should really do this book and i was like yeah we I, sure we should and he's like oh is there something where i was like no it's just like I, it's been two years and i've seen literally zero pages from you from this book so like you're right we should do it but like it's up to you it's not up to me um, the thing I can control is like writing the novels and, and I've written five novels this year. Comparatively, I've finished one, uh, you know, one arc of comic and probably a second arc of comics. So maybe two comics I've done this year, but in the same time, I'll have written my sixth book. Probably I'll finish this month. I'll start my seventh book next month. So it's just, it's, it's the thing that I know I can control. I can't control any other part of this process. Like it is all in the control of the artist or the producer or the production company or the showrunner or, or, or somebody else. The only piece that I can control is, um, is the writing. And once the writing's done, if for some reason an editor is not available, like I can find another editor for it or I can do another thing with it. But I, I can always continue the writing process forward. And 
while it does cost, let's say, $1,000, depending on the size of the book, $1,500 to like finish a, a book book, um, it's nothing comparatively to comics. You know, that same amount of money I could do a half dozen uh, that that it takes to do one graphic novel, I could do a half dozen comics uh, novels in that same time. So, the thing that I can control is the novels, and so I I choose to make that the thing that I care most about. The thing that I love most, the medium I love most is comics, but. I'm not an artist, so there's only so much control I can have of that. Like, I can't wake up today and know I'm going to get pages of comic. I can know I'm going to get the 10 pages of comic eventually, like the last 10 pages of, of this volume, like eventually, but I don't, like, I don't, I don't know when eventually is going to be. Sure, I, might, I can see why the, the juxtaposition between actually producing and, and having content coming out and what you love to do so there is the throw up when you got to bring somebody else into it, right absolutely i mean and just like when you wake up every day the thing that i can control is writing five thousand words that's mm -hmm. the thing i can control or editing twenty thousand words or proofing forty thousand words you know i can i can control that piece I can't control any other piece except my piece. And I learned a long time ago that um, if you focus on other people's karma, it, you will never be happy. And the only way, the only thing you can control is your own karma and the stuff you put into the world. And the rest of it is luck, really. It's getting like, it, 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 it's lucky that like Ichabod Jones just happened to like hit and I had the right team in place at the right time. I mean, I had no idea what I was doing when I made that comic. Um, I had some idea what I was doing when I made Katrina and much more over time. And like, you know, you can influence luck on some level, but there's, I put up so much work and so much of it just lands with a thud that and like the, 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 what you can control is doing quality work and then putting that work out and whether it and, and and putting a good marketing plan in front of it and if it does well awesome uh it, that's that's more a a like uh a a a a a, a process of like the god smiling on you than like you having it have having a, a being able to tell that like something is going to do well you know, like Cthulhu is hard to spell was a book manufactured to do well. And like it did do well, but so rarely do you get that ability to say this is, and, and, and to put good work in because, you know, you could go and manufacture a hit, um, but those works often are hollow. So being able to to manufacture a hit and love the hit that you manufacture, those are really few and far between. Um, I'm dealing with that with my own podcast right now of like, it just, you know, we've got 200 episodes and, and it, it's strange stuff when it's changed. And like, I realized like when I brought it back, like that, it was uh, the minute that I brought, like, I lost 40% of the audience from the previous time that I had the show. And I just like, like it's bled subscribers every episode until it's now like a shell of its former self as far as like how many but the show's better like the show's better it's so much better than it ever was when i first in its first incarnation like the the questions that i ask and the the, the things that i care about and the way that i can dive into stuff is like it's so much better because i am so much better as an interviewer and as a creator than i ever have been before um but those things do not necessarily mean that you're going to have a hit. And part of being a creative person is knowing when to cut and run and when to reevaluate and when you don't care that there's no audience for it. You just love it. You know, my friend puts, 
a lot of my friends put out birthday books every year and their birthday books tend to be books that like, I know no one's going to buy this book. Like, I don't care. I just, I have to do something that I want to do for once. I have to do something in a weird genre or an off thing or something or other, because like, I can't do the thing that I'm like, I can't, I can't write the same book again and again and again and again forever. And that ends up being a thing that like writers get into, you know, there are very few genres that really sell on Amazon. Um, and those genres tend to be things where people want to read the same story over and over and over and over and over again. So if you are successful in those genres, you end up writing the same book like 50 times. And uh, like, there's nothing wrong with that. Like, I'm, this is not like a, 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 uh, a like condemnation of that tactic. It is just a truth that like, that is what happens. People want to, if you write cozy mysteries, people want the same cozy mystery. They want like the same construction. And when you are creating a, a world or a, 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 a series, any series, you know, you are making a pact with the audience. When they read the first book, this is what I'm going to get for the rest of the series. Um, and that could be a 90,000 word book broken up into three stories. It could be a 60,000 word book. It could be all sorts of things. But like when they read the first book or watch the first episode or whatever that thing is, like that is a compact that you are making. And you can slowly grow the series over time. But like every year of Harry Potter is one year of Harry Potter's life at Hogwarts. Like it's one year, it's one year. Uh, the Hunger Games, every Hunger Games is one Hunger Game. It, it's like, that's the construction of the book. Um, the third, uh, uh, and, and, and by the time she got, uh, Suzanne Collins got to the third book, she was able to kind of move that from like, like the, where it was to sort of the new paradigm and break it in the end of the second book. But uh, you know, I don't think that could have gone to a fourth or fifth or sixth book because like the book was over. Like the really, you can just like the seventh Harry Potter book, like you can break the series at the end of the series uh, to, to, to tell like an open expansive story. But those first six books are one year at Hogwarts. They are the first two of Suzanne Coll or like one, one, uh, one uh, Hunger Game. And Someone who's gonna, someone who reads the first book to read the second book, they have to understand that this is the compact they're going to get and appreciate and approve of it, and then they'll buy the second book. Um, so, no matter what, when you're writing a series, like that's the series. Like the series has the same rough construction every 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 volume. Every volume will have X, Y, and Z things happen. Uh, you know, every, every romance novel has the same six or seven beats. They have like the girl and the guy, they have a meet cute, they have a first date, they're awkward with each other. Maybe they don't like each other. They slowly find that they like care about each other. The, then they do something that breaks the trust and it sends them apart and then they come back together. A mystery novel has the same construction every time. Like there is a detective and that detective is on a case and that case has a clue and that clue leads them to a suspect and that suspect is not the right suspect. And then they have to, then, then they get another thing and it leads them on a different path that is not the right path. And then somebody who they met in the original, in the beginning of the story ends up being the real killer at the end. Like they all have the same construction. And, um, and so it's, 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 and it's, 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 it's so when, like it's hard, it's, it's important to understand that. But then also like my friends are like, this is like, I know I love writing these books, but I also want to write this weird, crazy book every once in a while, because um, uh, even though it doesn't sell, because I like need to have something that is different than the other thing. It's one of the reasons I think that most writers that I know have, especially fast writers have two series that they work on um, at the same time. So I never really understood it until I really started writing faster, but it's, you burn out on one series and then you can go, even if the series is in enough, it's in the same genre, it has a different construction. So maybe it's a mythological fantasy versus fairy tales, or maybe it's just the way you constructed the book is, is, is considerably different between the two series and it allows your brain to like release and, 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 and not get stuck on this one series. So 
so uh, I, I don't know. That was uh, that, that that was a long rant about nothing. But uh, that's uh, 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 that's how I like at least construct uh, like a, a, a think about these things, and I think about them a lot. Makes a lot of sense. What are, what are your core values? Man, these have changed so much over the years. So um, honesty is number one. Um, um, uh, but not like dickish honesty, like, like not brutal honesty. Um, but I think that it's the most important thing is for you to be honest with your audience and for you to, to, to be honest with yourself and to do it in a way that is kind, but also in a way that is kind to you. So I'll give you an example of what, uh, uh, so people, uh, uh, I, I snap at people a lot on my Facebook page um, because they'll ask something that I find to be wholly un, uh, 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 uncool. Uh, or, or they'll be asking something of me. Like I'm a rather successful person. So I get a lot of asks happening for me all the time. And uh, 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 they, they, people don't necessarily know that like, it's not appropriate to ask like for me to explain something to you. <laughs> like I get paid a lot of money to do that. And like, you can Google. So like, I don't like when people I, I just assume that that because they asked they think that they asked a simple question that is actually a simple question um but i also try to be quite honest so uh, but i feel like i it, it is my job to be honest with people in a way that um will enhance their ability to live life so i talk a lot about my depression and anxiety that i was suicidal around, uh, like in june of last year um, that, uh, that like all of these things, but I try to do it in a way that will like give them agency in their own life. And I think that is the important part of honesty, especially when you have an audience, it's not about like breaking them down. Uh, uh, it, it, it's about, well, it's about showing people how you want them to react, interact with you. Like I do not want to be, uh, pitched people's projects or told to buy people's projects. And so I will like bite someone's head off if they do that to me, because I don't ever want that ever. Like it's not fair. Like, uh, and, 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 and I, and I don't want to have, like, I have friends that get like 30 requests a day. And I'm like, I never get requests like that because like I told, I was very clear with people that they are to never do that to me. And, uh, but I only do that. I'm only that way with people very rarely because I want to be kind to myself. And I think that being honest with yourself means being kind to yourself, which is another thing that I really care about is being kind. Now that does not mean always being nice. You know, a lot of people need to have some hard truths thrown at them. And I have no problem throwing those hard truths not in a mean way or in a brutal way, but in an honest way and hopefully in a kind way. So they will stop doing the thing that they do because it's not like, I have a friend who was like, I want to write Christian fiction. I was like, I hope you like never independent authors in Christian fiction. There's just not a lot of money in there. Like it, it, you should do it as long as you're okay, like to never make money, like, or like to know that like three people are making money in that genre. Like it's just not a big genre for independent authors. It is a big genre uh, for certain things, but it's not a big genre. And so like, it's not kind to tell that, to just tell that person, yes, that sounds great because it does not sound great if he wants to make money. Uh, it's fine if you just want to write that and you're okay. Or like, you want to make that your birthday book or like, you're just a really, like I write mythological fantasy. It is such a small genre that like, it, it, like it's, it's horrible on Amazon. Like nobody buys the books on Amazon. They'll buy them on Kickstarter or they buy them from my website or like they'll do it when I'm in a bundle, but like they don't buy, like go, like there's not a ton of people going to write funny mythological fantasy on like, Amazon. It just, it's not like a big, it's not mystery. It's not romance. It's not 
uh, 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 like the, 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 the gods and monster mythology stuff that sells is all romance. So romance and mystery are what sells. There are some other genres that sell, but like I know that like when if I'm if I'm writing the books that I want to write for the audience that I write for, like it's I'm gonna cap out, and it's important for me to know that like like I because if I know that then I know what to expect when I put the books out there into the open market. They're gonna probably do well on Kickstarter. Um, they're gonna do well with my existing fan base or when I go to shows, but like I am not expecting them to catch fire on Amazon because it's just not the series that it is. I have another series that I'm constructing specifically for the let's go break Amazon-ness of it, uh, but it's not kind to tell somebody to, uh, to keep going on something when you know they're going down a path that is bad or that is misinformed or is ill-informed, especially when you have more information uh, for them. Um, I mean, I let a lot of people just do whatever they want, but like for someone I care about, I won't just let them. I, I, I will say, look, it's okay if you want this to be the, the, like if you want to do this, but like I need you to know that like these things are not probably going to happen. And sometimes I'm wrong. I told my friend recently that, uh, you know, he should plan to have like a much lower Kickstarter goal than he, than, than like, uh, uh, than he thought he should have. And I was like, well, you know, he was, he was, he was talking about a friend of ours. And I was like, this, like, that is an outlier. I was like, let's go to Kickstarter. I'll show you how many books actually like are at that level. And he's like, and when we looked, he's like, oh, like, that's really not that many. And I was like, it is not that many. It's one, two, maybe five. Uh, and then he launched his book and it raised like $45,000 and like for like one issue of comic book. And like, I was completely wrong. Um, but I still feel good about at least setting the expectation appropriately because he probably like odds were he was not going to be the one that broke through. He ended up being the one that broke through, but out of 250 comics or 2,500 books that launch every day on Amazon, the odds that you are going to be the one of the ones that are going to break through without a big audience already or a lot of ad spend are very low. This is so low that like you, sh uh, if you're going to plan on that, you should plan to, uh, to be in one of the very popular genres and probably with the tropes that are selling right now. And if you're, then it's okay if you don't want to be that, but you, 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 you have to go in there knowing what you should expect. Otherwise, you're going to think that you're a bad writer when the truth is you just are a bad marketer or you picked a bad market. And we all do it. Like we all, we all have passion projects that like some of them catch on, a lot of them don't. Looking at a big stack of books of which like, Many of them are passion projects that never caught on. That does not mean the books are not bad or bad. They're great books. And when people read them, they tend to love them. Um, but many people don't read them. Uh, so, uh, uh, so yeah, like kindness and honesty. And then um, I, I guess perseverance would be the third one. Um, there are so many people that want to do something that it feels daunting at first. But I have learned that uh, if you just keep going, uh, most of those people fall off. And I think about this, I was telling you uh, about that I try to do 10,000 steps a day earlier. And one of the things that is, um, that is uh, really interesting about that is I do two loops around my block, but that's not 10,000 steps. So I need to also do these, like every hour, do 250 steps outside to get to my 10,000 steps in a day. Because like, it's not just, a, it's, it's not about these big goals. It's not about these big chunks. Like the big chunks are super helpful, but you also have to do the work between those big chunks to hit your goal. And that is true when I've done Kickstarters or at shows, sometimes there'll be big rushes, or, but, but like, the money is one in the, the, the profit and loss is one in the little moments, in the hours before, between the rushes. It's in being able to keep going when all the chips are down or when you're so tired that you can barely stand or all of those things 
are super important to continue on because if you if you do four thousand and four thousand, that's eight thousand. But like, if your goal is twelve thousand, the only way to get there is to do two fifty this day and two fifty there. This whatever the the goal is, like you have to have the strategy for when when the lulls happen, and if you can keep creating or moving forward in those lulls, then you end up having a, 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 a pretty solid career. And if, you know, I don't think I'm the most talented writer. I just think that I'm willing to keep writing in the lull. I'm willing to keep releasing stuff. I'm willing to st try new strategies when there's no, when, when it seems like there's no money. And I'm like, I will go grasp for $300 or $200 or a hundred dollars here. Or like, I'll go grasp for these things because I know that if you make, a hundred dollars a day over 30 days, that's $3,000. You know, if you can add that to like two big launches at the beginning and end of a launch, you could be making like, that's, that, that's the difference between hitting a goal or missing a goal. That's a, that. And so, uh, I, I, I don't, I, I'm not one who believes in and you should never quit. In fact, I think that winners always quit. Like I think that winners never quit is like one of the most, idiotic statements that has ever been around they quit everything except the thing that works except the thing that lights them up except the thing that they can't quit but they quit everything else like you know like uh, how many products has apple or, or 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 windows abandoned over the years like tons of products tons of them uh, there there are there are there are storage facilities all over this country with stuff that just Apple does not sell anymore. Like they, they, they don't quit on the iPhone or they don't quit trying to innovate, but they quit all sorts of stuff. And, uh, but I think that uh, when you find something that you love and that you're good at and that you works, you should keep doing that thing. And you should always be working to innovate and try other stuff. But like, you should never just continue on with a product that is subpar or that does not have a huge market for it. Ichabod, for instance, it took 10 years for me to have the confidence to do another one of these books because it came out and it, it, with Viper, it did not do well. It did middling on Kickstarter. Uh, it did middling at shows. It wasn't until 2017 that it really sort of found its sea legs. And that I thought that I could actually like make a run at doing more Ichabod. But before then, it was just kind of like the other book on my table that kind of didn't sell very well. Um, and I was not ready. You know, one of the reasons I didn't make more Ichabod was just there was, there, there was no financial reason for me to do so. I thought I would get egg in my face. And so, but, but once I thought that there was a financial reason to do it, uh, I then doubled down and I did it. And then the, uh, the, the fan base proved that like there was an audience for Ichabod and, uh, and now there's almost three volumes done. So, so uh, like giving up does not mean uh, perseverance or are almost too, so like they're, they're necessary because you can't persevere in everything. You can persevere in a couple of things and then you have to give up all the other stuff because in order, I, I, I learned a couple of my friends when I, was before I really hit it, um, they said, eventually you're going to have to choose. You have to either be a publisher or creator. I was like, that's crazy. Well, you can do both. Like, I'm like, what about blah, 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 blah. And I named some people and th they were like, they're like, okay, just like, okay. Like, like, and then I, I got to a place and I was like, I can't, I can't have a full publishing line and still create stuff at the level that I want to. And I really had to choose and double down on one of them. And I choose I chose creating, but I only chose creating because like there was a path for me there. You know, I had raised $25,000 on, um, on, on two Kickstarters that year. And like, I, like there, like it was logical for me to, to like do my own work because fans of my work said, I don't care about want to be press. I only care about the stuff that you do. You personally do. So like, it totally opened my eyes to the ability to take a path that I thought was closed because, you know, most people can't make a living as a creator. Uh, so, so I do think that like perseverance is one thing that I truly value, but I also think you have to be smart about it. 
Well, it's, I mean, it makes a hell of a lot of sense, to be quite honest. Um, how, how do you preserve yourself emotionally and energy point of view? Because there's a lot out there, you know, there's, there's, you're, you're very, um, you know, obviously people buy or they don't buy people leave reviews or they don't leave reviews. They become raving fans or they don't become raving fans. But how, how can you preserve your own energy that that doesn't directly affect you every time? You just have to understand that like that's their karma. Your karma is doing the work that you do and figuring out how to do the marketing better and figuring out how to make better products and understanding that they won't all hit. I mean, I've put out so many books and I can count on one hand how, hand how many of them have hit in a way that like made sense for me to keep making more. And just like, I don't know if there's a good way. You just have to understand that like, so I did, I've done four launches this year on Kickstarter. The first one raised $9,900. The second one raised $31,000. The third one raised $9,500. And this one has raised, I think, $16,000 so far. That's live right now. It's the same Russell. It's the same like person launching them. I created them except for the anthology, which I there were 70 creators, but I edited and published and all of that stuff, that book. And they were vast, wildly different successes. You know, I had the business of art, my first podcast, it would get like 250 downloads. This new one, for some reason, is down to like close, is down to 100. But I know the products better. So the only option is that I, I, like, I am no longer serving the people that like already listened to the podcast. And like, that's okay. That's like, like, like that means I should probably end the podcast, which I'm doing, uh, and maybe launch something else and like just try for something, a completely new audience. And that's something that you can do with books by recovering the book, repackaging the book, relaunching the book. And like suddenly you have a whole new book and it might find an audience or, you know, especially when you write a good book, you know, the ability to, to repackage it and to rebundle it is, is infinite. Um, sometimes you hit it out of the park the first time with, uh, with Ichabod, it took seven printings before we really found the, 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 the cover that worked for the book. And it's this cover that you see behind me. But that was not the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth cover. It was the seventh cover of the book. Um, I, I also just don't do things. Like I, I learned last year that doing mo more is not, does not mean that you get more out of it. You know, uh, uh, I did 100 podcasts this year. And like my pot, and, and, and I was told that like, like you do a lot of podcast interviews and like you will get more. And I was like, I've not found that. I've not found that at all. I've not found that at all. Like, uh, 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 you know, the, the audience is going down, not up. And so I was like, all right, like I will try a lot of stuff. But like when it stops servicing me, I'll stop. And I'll be like, that didn't work for me. Like, and, and, and you have to understand that like someone else, it, like this strategy that they're talking about might work great did not work for me. And it was not worth a hundred hours of my time to do. It was not worth not writing books. It was not worth three months of doing nothing but like podcast interviews every day. Um, it was not, I did not feel like it moved my career along when I got to the end of it, but I didn't know it would not move my career along at the beginning. So I think that we spend a lot of our time saying that won't work, that won't work, that won't work, that won't work. Um, without just saying, well, let's try it. Let's try it. Let's try it and see if it works. Because like, it probably won't. But like, you never know, you know, so many people tell me that conventions don't work. And I'm like, I don't know, man, like, I make so much money at conventions that like, I don't understand this thing. Or like, they tell me that Kickstarter is stupid. And I'm like, I don't know, man, I'm probably gonna raise like somewhere between 70 and $80,000 on Kickstarter this year. Like, I don't know, like, I pretty good for me. Like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty happy with like that return on my investment of, of time, energy, and effort into that launch. You know, people have told me mailing lists don't work. And I'm like, I can literally show you tens of thousands of dollars I've made off my mailing list, you know, or Facebook groups. It's like, I, well, they're not working so great for me now, but for years, like I was making tens of thousands of dollars on my, on my, on my Facebook group. Like it's, it's just, you know, and 
and, and some of these things don't work. The, the, the thing you have to be confident with is your work, that your work is good. And unfortunately, most people are at the beginning of their career and they are not confident that their work is good. And even more people, their work is not good. Um, but at a certain point, you kind of just are objectively good. You know, you may not be everyone's cup of tea, but like you are objectively good. You know, like I have made over $100,000 the last four years. Like that's objectively good. Like, I'm, I don't know, like, like objectively, like people keep coming back to my work. And they keep telling me how good it is, like over and over and over again. And more important, like they keep buying the books, even when they don't tell me, they just keep buying the books. So like kind of objectively, you have to say, I'm good. Like I'm good. Like I, I'm not just like middling, you know, like I'm making good money doing this work. Like I am good at the thing that I'm doing. And once you can make that statement and objectively make it, I'm not saying like subjectively lie to yourself. I'm like, you can objectively be like, well, I've made considerable amount of money doing this. And like people are keep buying my work and like, they keep asking me to work with them and yada. yada. Like if you can make that, then the only option is that the marketing is bad or the product is not right for the for, for right then and there you know i think about dropbox a lot and like i like came into dropbox late because i was using other products that i think work better still to this day i think work better than dropbox but dropbox happened to be the one that won happened to be the one that like became the household name um, you know, Lyft is as good as Uber or better and they are not, they don't have horrible business practices, as horrible business practices as Uber, but like still we say Uber, we don't say Lyft, we say Uber, um, you know, and, and, uh, and, 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 and there's, that does not mean that like Lyft's business model is bad, that they are bad, like they're objectively a good company. Well, I mean, at least they are, as a company, they are good. The, the, what they put into the world is nebulous, but, you know, uh, <clears throat> you know, there are plenty of other companies that, 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 that do good work and they, they put their plan together and they're smart and then they put something out and it does not hit. It was not something that was needed. And we always look at the winners, but there, for every winner, there's a hundred losers. There's a hundred people who tried to put out a product and was like, there, were, there was lukewarm or they fizzled or like the marketing was wrong or the audience was wrong or their assumptions were wrong. And unfortunately, when you're putting together a product, all you have are assumptions. Like when you're making a book, for instance, you're saying, you like this, 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 and this. So I'm going to put these all together and put my spin on it. And like, you'll like this. And uh, sometimes that works. Many times it doesn't. And, um, and, and, and you have to understand that is a part of business. That's just a part of, 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 of it. And you're hoping to have a couple of bangers. It would be great to have like a couple of products that whenever you put it out, they were a hit. They, they, they like, they pushed like it forward. And if you could have two, three, four launches a year of things that you're guaranteed of hits that are, that are hit, you have a career. Like you have a career. If you can just keep putting out these same kind of products that you know are hits, even if you make 20 that are not hits. And so the whole part of a career becomes trying like Ichabod was a hit, I thought. And then Katrina was a bigger hit. And then Cthulhu was a bigger hit. And like every, at every stage you're trying to grow the hits. And so you can kind of make a better and better and better career every time you launch something. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the not get, I mean, I still sometimes get upset when I go to Goodreads and there's not like a new review or there's a new review for a book that like was an anthology that I was part of and not like my own work or when like, I think that Ichabod should be uh, doing a lot better on Kickstarter than it is right now or something or another, like, but I, I, I have to understand that the failing is not on me as a creator, it's on me as a publisher or a marketer or of something else. Uh, the market is fickle and audiences are fickle and, and we have to really under, like cocoon ourselves. And I like to say, you know, did I do the best with the resources that I was given? Like, did I make the best product I could given the time 
energy, effort, yada, yada, yada that I could do. And if I said that, and, and also like with the skill level that I had, and I, if I can say yes to those statements, then I can be happy. Then I, I have to be happy. I have to not beat myself up over that people didn't buy it uh, or that, that people didn't get it, that people, uh, people don't understand it. You know, uh, uh, I, I think about like Isaac Asimov a lot. And I'm like, you know, Isaac Asimov had over 400 books. Name, name any one. Name one that is not in the Foundation or Robot Trilogy. You know, uh, 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 Kurt Vonnegut had dozens of books. Name one that's not Slaughterhouse-Five, Cat's Cradle, or Breakfast of Champions. Uh, George R. R. Martin had dozens of books. Name one that's not Game of Th- in the Game of Thrones series. You know, I mean, these pe- these, and these pe- people who wrote for decades, decades, that they put out tons of stuff. George R. R. Martin wrote for TV, wrote for movies, and wrote a bunch of books. Unless you're a fan of George R. R. Martin, like, like Stephen King writes tons of books. Like, name one of his less popular ones. You know, uh, uh, if you're not a Stephen King fan, you're just not going to be able to do it. Like so few things from the best people in the world don't rise to the level of quote unquote, like mass market success. You know, uh, I, I'm like name three romance authors. That's the literal most popular genre on Amazon. And unless you were a romance fan, I bet you could not name one that's not Daniel Steele or Nora Roberts. Maybe you could, I don't know, mm-hmm. but like, uh, 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 you know, it, it, is, it is the biggest genre and, uh, and, and, and very few stars in that genre, like that are like mass market stars that like just any old schmo would understand, would, 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 would be able to uh, track down. So, you know, given that, like even Stephen King is a huge loser and like even he like only can sell to one of a thousand people that know of his work. Um, like, like you got to give yourself a break. Like you give yourself a break, you know, like, yeah, a bunch of people probably read his dark tower series and probably maybe read the shining or Cujo or, 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 uh, or Salem's lot or like one or two of his books, but very few people follow all of Stephen King's work, you know, and, 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 that's just the way that business is, you know, like, 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 uh, any, any, any successful person that you see has, is their career is littered with stuff that they thought was going to work. And then it just didn't. And all they, all people see are the successes here and here and here and here and here. I, I really, I really dis, I, I, I listen to a lot of these entrepreneurship shows, but I, I, I also have a big problem with them because they, they have a habit of saying, well, this guy knew that this market was like right there and like nobody. And I was like, no, it probably were dozens of people who tried to hit this market or are still trying to hit this market and failed. Like this person happened to have the right product at the right time at the right price point to succeed. But like most of business is analyzing the market and like, dropping depth charges enough times that like you will have a hit and then you can ride that hit until the next hit. I love it. What do people get you? Oh God. Uh, I don't know enough enough. I think, but you want to, these are all very hard concepts to understand and really like, like people think that I work 20 hours a day. I'm like, dude, I just, I don't like you can, you can make that claim, but like, it's not true. Like I work maybe a soft 12 hours a day, but like most of those hours are like dicking around on YouTube or like looking at, at Amazon music or something. Like maybe I've got like six or seven hours of real work to do in a day. Um, most of my time is spent thinking, which is like a vastly underrated thing. But no, I mean, one of the problems with success honestly is it's, it's very lonely because like I have a small group of friends that I can talk about this with, but like when things are not going well, you can't just say it because it seems like you're complaining. 
and then you're not taking your success, you're taking your success for granted. But like, you know, still human, successful people, or they're still human. Like, like launches, I was telling my friend, I was like, okay, so the first Cthulhu is Hard to Spell book raised $39,000. And the second one raised um, uh, $31,000. And you think that's good. But for me, that's like I, someone went into my bank account and took $8,000 from me. I was like, how would you feel if $8,000 were taken from you? And, and like 250 people that bought the first one didn't buy the second one. Like, would it make you feel good? Like, would you be happy with like that, that like $8,000, like your boss paid you $40,000 last year and they're only paying you $32,000 this year? Like, no, no, definitely not make you feel good. Uh, and, and in the same way, like while I'm incredibly ecstatic with how well the, the, the Cthulhu was hard to spell terrible to his book did, it was massively disappointing because it massively underperformed what we expected. Um, what I expected, which was to get to the, to the place we were at the first time, which was 39, which I really thought we should be at $50,000 for that first campaign. And we were already 10,000. So now we're $20,000 off the mark that I had set internally. But like, man, you tell people that, <sighs> you tell people that you expected 30 for Ichabod volume two, when you're going to get 20 or less than 20. And that's disappointing. And oh my God, like the, the vitriol that comes out of the woodwork that, that people think you're complaining when you're just stating a fact, like, like you have a projection at the beginning of this year. If you, it, it, like all shows all in, I was supposed to make somewhere around like 150 to 200. So like, let's say the low end of 150, like I'll, I'm, I'm probably going to break through a hundred barely. So that's like, I lost $50,000. I lost $20,000 from last year. So like, yeah, I made a hundred thousand dollars, but I, like, I, I, I was, I was spending as if I was going to make $150,000. So like, I mean, what do you like, 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 you know, that's bad. That's bad. Like you could be excited that you did 30 and still disappointed you didn't hit 40 or 50. Like, because that, those are the numbers, but people only see the end number. And they're like, you did, you did massively well. And I'm like, yeah, well, okay. Uh, and, and like so few people reach the mountaintop that like so few people understand what that means. Like so few people understand like what you're saying that like it is very lonely it's very lonely like i totally understand why people kill themselves as entrepreneurs because like they feel like like they are com feel completely unseen um and 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 I, I think enough people understand the ethos of what wannabe press and what russell nolte is about but i don't think that many people actually understand what i'm saying and I know that because I watch the comments section of my posts be twisted from the things that I actually mean. Um, and it's not because the people are bad, it's because they don't understand because they've never gotten there. You know, like the ability to, to only deal with your own stuff and not other people's stuff and not listen to when people have vitriol and hate for you is very hard when you've only got one person who like has vitriol and hate for you. But like when you are successful, any successful person is going to have a ton of people who have vitriol and hate for them. And if you, if you deal with all of them, you will never get anything done. Like if you deal with all the projects that are not moving forward instead of the things that you can control, you will never get anything done. If you switch between projects all of the time, when everybody is asking you to do projects for them, then you will never get anything done. So a lot of the things that we've talked about are concepts that are like very important for a very successful person that does not make sense to somebody who has never gotten there, not because, not because they're bad, just because they haven't gotten there yet. Like, they, they, like, like I, I did not understand it until I experienced it. And then when I had like five people in one week trying to tear me down, I was like, oh, this is why you just got to like let it roll off your back. 
And when I had projects that like, because at the beginning you have very few projects. And so like, you're like, every, how could everyone not be a hit? I'm putting so much time in. But when you've got 20 projects out there and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm like people only want to buy like three of these books that I've put out there, like in mass, like, wow. Like that's, that's like, it's mind blowing because you think like you've had some hits, you've had people buy your books. And it's one thing to have people like buy a couple of books that you could put effort into. But eventually when you have 20 books or 30 books or 50 projects going, like you can't put the, you, you can't put individual time and once have to live or die on their own. And that's when you start being like, oh, wow, yeah, that book that I thought was really successful, when I just leave it to its own devices, it does not sell. It does not sell, it's not successful. Um, and so, but these are, again, only things that you see when you're living day to day. And you can't even like drop in and drop out. You've got to like be living in it, like hands in it. Because otherwise, like it's just impossible to see what, what, like, like what people are talking about. And it was impossible for me to see until I sort of didn't just get to the mountain, like become successful, but I was able to live as a successful person for, you know, a couple of years and see things that were successful, become unsuccessful, see products that came into the gate strong, kind of fade away, see things that were corner pieces of my business become like ancillary or like the book marketing, like used to run my business. And this year, in the last year, it's like limped along into the point that it's not even worth doing anymore. And like, it literally like ran my business. Like it was the number one, it was easily the number one thing that I did and had the number one profit. And suddenly, like after two years, it just broke apart. And like, that is a thing that I had been told happened, but did not actually believe happened until I actually saw it. And I th always thought that when, I t when it happened, I could turn it around. And then to try everything and not be able to turn it around was like another thing. Because I was like, oh, yeah, some things just stall. And like you do everything you can and just there's nothing you can do. Or like there's nothing you can do without devoting more, more, uh, more, um, effort into this thing than you have the time to do. So I, I don't know. Like, I think both yes and no. Um, I, I think one of the reasons my show had a very small but devoted following is because like generally successful people or people who like understood listened to it, but there's very few of those people. Only because, not because there's not, like there's only so many spots for successful people up in the, the thing and like there's you know, anyway so yes and no i would say this is a very direct question and i mean it respectfully but why do you not kill yourself uh that's a really great question um i don't know if i have a good answer spite maybe <laughs> uh like I, I, I have things to do still. Like I have series to finish. Um, I have, I have, I, I have stuff that I still want to do. Um, I'm not out of love for the world yet. Um, I, I, and I, I, like I think that I can inspire a lot more people. Um, also, God. Okay, so here's a thing that is like that weighs on me. Um, like a lot of people look up to me and a lot of depressed and anxious people look up to me as a person who like has been successful through this stuff. And I don't know what would happen. Like I remember what happened when Anthony Bourdain killed himself and like it threw me in an existential crisis for like months because I was like, this is a person I looked up to a person who like openly was living with depression and like then could not live with it anymore. And I know it's not fair to put that on Anthony Bourdain, but like he kind of put it on himself and like, in the same way I kind of put it on myself to like um, be a, be a role model of some type maybe. Uh, and, and uh, I don't know what it would do if I did that. Like, I just don't, I don't know what it would do. Um, I, I, and I, I can't, can't, uh, I can't find that out. I can't, 
I can't find that out for, 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 for um, I don't want to find that out, but I, I really have just like more to say, I think. And that's, um, and, and, and I don't want to put my family who I love through that, my wife through that. Um, yeah, I think mostly it's, I feel like I have more to say and I feel like I, 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 people on some level rely on me to, whether it's fair or not, like stay strong in the face of all of this shit that's going on. Absolutely. I'm just conscious of time and want to be respectful of your time. Um, a couple of final questions, really. One is, do you like yourself? Do you love yourself? I love myself as much as I hate myself. Uh, I think that you, uh, that, that you can't really uh, get through this kind of thing without loving the work that you do, which is a big part of yourself. Mm. Um, I've gotten a lot better at not hating myself. I'm on a lot of meds now. Uh, and they, my, when I was not on meds, I would wake up and uh, the, the, the running narrative to my head was you should just kill yourself today. And I would struggle very hard to just get to maybe you're just okay or like maybe life is okay. Since I started taking meds, I start at maybe this is okay. And so I get to good days a lot easier. Hmm. I, I, um, uh, I certainly like, so I, I like that I can inspire other people to do stuff and that hmm. I can like bring other people uh, uh, to a new level of awareness. And whenever I feel like I hate myself, I do some sort of post or act of service that like m does that for s other people. And that makes me like myself. So I guess uh, I, I don't know, but I can certainly trick myself into liking myself most days um, hmm. and at most times. And the times that I don't, I try to escape that feeling so i'm a lot better at 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 not self-sabotaging and not hating myself than i used to be um, mm. but yeah it still comes up i mean when people say they always love themselves I, I i don't understand those people you know like neurotypical people i just don't understand like they've never woken up and just like they're they're running narrative on a regular day with that they wanted that they should just kill themselves like mm -hmm. i just don't understand like how like they could just wake up and be happy i mean good for them but like they're like freaking like superheroes to me um so so yeah i i i, I kind of like myself most of the time mm. do, do you find yourself having to having to i mean very respectfully, you come across, and I think reading between the lines, and I love your business acumen and your your the logic sense. I mean, you're almost to me it comes across you're dumbing yourself down to be understood. Does that does that resonate? Does that make sense? No, I don't think so. I think that business acumen is actually very dumb. Uh, like I think that people oversimplify. My whole life has been about simplifying business topics and all this mm -hmm. stuff for regular people to understand and specifically for creatives to understand. I think that truly smart people uh, can talk about topics in a way that a five-year-old can understand. And it is people that are I don't want to say dumb, but like that, 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 that don't feel like they are intelligent or don't have a firm grasp that end up speaking more intelligently than they need to so that they sound smart. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's how I've always been able to tell truly smart people from not smart people. Truly smart people could talk about like quantum physics um, and make it understandable to me who does not understand quantum physics besides like quarks and stuff like the quarks exist. But um, it, whenever I, 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 feel, I leave a topic more confused, I don't necessarily think that person's dumb. I think what that person doesn't understand the topic. So they grasp onto the biggest words that they could find that would make them seem like they understood the topic. But most topics 
can and should be explained simply. I remember literally listening to someone explain to me quantum physics once, and I actually got it for a split second. And I was like, oh, you must really understand that concept. So like, no, I, I don't think that I dumb. I, I think intentionally, um, if I'm going to explain a topic to somebody, I need to do it in a way that they can understand, whether that's religion or politics. And most people do not have the level of insight that I have from studying these things for a decade. This does not mean they are dumb or stupid. It's just like they haven't studied politics for like a decade. They just, they're, 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 they're casual voters uh, or uh, they don't understand religion because they like, they're lapsed Catholics who maybe go to mass twice a year. But like I, uh, mythology or whatever, like I am deep inside all of those things, writing books and like building a business. And so it is my job to be able to take that information that I have gathered and spin somebody up to speed as quickly as humanly possible. Um, and, 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 and as simply as humanly possible. So that feel like there, there's no benefit to me talking at somebody in a way that, that like they don't understand. That's a waste of both of our times. It makes them feel dumb. It makes, it maybe makes me feel smart, but like it, it doesn't do anything to like, it, it's a waste of time and I hate wasting time. So I, I agonize over how to explain topics in a way that, that can be understood by somebody who does not have the level of sophistication with a topic that I do. And I very much appreciate anyone who can do the same because I do not have a thousand years to learn a topic when I turn on a podcast or I listen to an audio book, like I've got that amount of time to figure out what a concept is and if I want to learn more about it. And so um, I think it's a, it's a wonderful gift when somebody can explain something simply with simple language. And if you read my books, you'll see that like, I generally use uh, fifth or sixth, maybe seventh grade uh, uh, reading level to like explain the concepts because I want people to get lost in the story, not get confused about the words that I'm trying to use or the concepts I'm trying to explain. I want them to get it and just be able to keep the story flowing. So it's a bit like the TED talk principles, isn't it? It's, it's bloody hard to give a 10 minute talk. You know, it's so me- hard. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's so hard when somebody can explain a concept that is complicated in a way that you can understand. It's in the same way that to go back to like making a book or like making a movie, like those things are so impossible. And the people that make it easy, look easy. Or if you ever look at something and say, wow, I could do that. Like, no, you couldn't. Not at this, like you could learn to do it, but like they are making it seem so much easier because they are comfortable in their skin and they know how to teach it in a way that it slides into you. Um, but I, I've been thinking about this a lot with, you know, the fires raging and the water. And like, I think one of the great skills that a person can master is how to be still in the rage, in, 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 in the storm and to just be able to stand and, and, and have everything slow down around them and to know how to handle a situation. And, you know, I think that we, we lionize people who do like 500 things at once, but I think there's a, gr- the, the, there's a great skill in being able to stand and look into the eye of the storm and say, and, and, and like let the rain wash over you and like not freak out about it and just be able to calmly say, this is what we're going to do now. And, uh, and by looking at somebody, you, st- you think they're an idiot. They're like, what are they doing in the storm? Like, and everyone else is running like a chicken with their head cut off. But the person that can really sit in that storm for a couple of minutes and say, all right, these are the best course. This is the best course of action. And the simplest course of action um, is somebody that I, I, I've learned to respect much more and more as time goes on, even though they don't look as busy as everyone else. Um, the person who's standing still, 
Of course, there's a person that's standing still and has no idea what's going on. And that's the problem. See, that's the problem with like uh, a genius and ignorance is like they look the same from the outside. And you really have to get good at, r at realizing like who is who is explaining the simple concept, the complicated concept in a simple way because they like truly know what they're talking about and who is doing it because they don't understand the concept at all and they don't even understand the high level concept enough to make it to to and it's hard because like i said like they look the same from the out they look like two idiots standing in the storm and like one of them is a genius and one of them has no idea what's going on generally generally the giveaway i suppose is when, as soon as they open their mouth <laughs> that's that's the telltale hopefully hopefully that's the telltale. hopefully <laughs> oh i love it uh again so i want to be respectful of your time so tell us russell i mean in terms of you know what's what's your fire in the belly i don't know you said most people say passion i can't not say passion i'm trying to think of a different way to say it but like it's not just passion though because like passion only gets you so far like i think the so I, I've done a lot of interviews on my show, The Complete Creative, and of people who have done their creative career for decades. And what they told me was that the, the secret is to be able to burn it all down and rise back again and do something else and to move and to, and, and to be nimble. And um, f for me, the fire in my belly is less passion and more compulsion. Like I understand like the thing that I'm doing is foolish. You know, like, like writing books is a foolhardy errand. Like A, like if you go to business school, they tell you, uh, don't go where, all, where, where there's a ton of competition. Don't go where, they, where, where, where people are, um, are, uh, are competing on price. Uh, uh, don't go where the, uh, where the, um, where the people who buy expect things for free. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and don't buy where this very, it's very hard to differentiate yourself. And like books are all of that. Books are, uh, books are a race to the bottom in price. Um, they're over, they're, they're, they're flooding the market. Like there's, t you could get thousands of books for free and like, it's hard to differentiate yourself in books. And so like selling any other widget is probably better than a book. Um, and I, I it, and, and that's what I think people mean when they say, when they say, um, like, uh, 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 if you could do anything else, do it. it. It's not like, go piss off. It's like, this is a stupid way to make a living. Like art, like, 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 like uh, 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 writing, you know, there's so many, it's uh, a film, TV. There's like so many people who want to do it. The competition is so fierce that the odds that you're going to make a decent living in the long run is, is small. And like even the best selling authors are like making less than like the best tech entrepreneurs. You know, like Stephen King is making a fraction of what Mark Zuckerberg is making or some oil baron or like whatever. You know, uh, uh, Francis Ford Coppola like decided to start making wine because he didn't think like films were stable enough. So like, it's, 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 it's incredibly hard. And like, I think that like passion gets you so far, but it compulsion is what like I fall back on all the time. It's like, I have the, the fire in my belly has, 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 uh, burned out dozens of times in my career. And people ask me like, how did you keep going? And I'm like, honestly, like, I didn't think I would. And, but then the fire came back. And it came back again, it came back again, and it came back again, and it came back. And it got to the point where like writing was the only thing that like calmed my mind. And so like it became a literal compulsion that like I couldn't not do it. And I, 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 I think that there has to be some of that like lunatic compulsion in you to make a creative career work because there's so many people who are flooding into the market who want to be authors or graphic designers or sculptors or, and they're all, the talent level has never been higher. 
And so the, the odds of getting, of standing out are less and less and less. And unless you have that, like, I literally can't do anything else. Like, not that I don't have these skills to do anything else. It's another part of the, if you can do something else, do it. It's not that I don't have these skills to do other things. Like I could, I could go into sales. I could like go into, I don't know, stock market prediction. There's all sorts of things that I'm like, well, I could just become a coach, like whatever the thing is. Like I, I could sell courses. I, there's all sorts of things that I can move myself into doing, but like, I can't not write. I can't not do it. And like, it is a compulsion as much as it is a passion. It comes across, and I don't normally comment on people's response, but it comes across like it's almost a mix of hope and faith as well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hope, faith, and lunacy, like at the, same, <laughs> at, at the same time. And it's really what it is. It's faith in the audience mm. and, ho- and like that they will, that when I, I, I mean, making anything creative, and that includes a company or like an ice cream or like anything, like anything you're, when I say creating, I mean like you are taking nothing and you are making something like from scratch. You're not like iterating on like Kellogg's frosted mini wheats or like whatever the thing is. Like you are taking something and saying, this is a brand new thing. There is, it, it's like a trust fall. You are, you are, you are, you are putting a lot of time, faith and energy. And you are like, you have faith that the market and the audience are going to catch you before you fall onto the ground. And often they're, they're catching you like inches from bankruptcy or like <laughs> centimeters from going crazy. But once you do it enough and you have a robust enough portfolio and big enough name, the, 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 the trust is bigger and the ambitions can become bigger, which is like why I try to keep my ambitions uh, uh, moderate so that I like don't suddenly have like to be caught from 50 feet. Like I try to keep being caught while I can still survive if I hit the ground. Yeah. But yeah, it is. It's like, it, it is the hope and the faith that the audience will be there. And I, even if I don't have a hit, I can at least break even. And this has become the great understanding of like why, why uh, people are putting out, like why a company has to put out 10, 10 movies to have one hit. It's because like, they just don't know. They do their best with all of the 10 and they hope to break even on nine and have the 10th one, like be their breakaway hit. Because the, you never know what the audience is going to love or, with, or what they're going to hate or what like is going to hit the public zeitgeist at the time or what's gonna leave the public zeitgeist or what suddenly you're gonna find 20 years later and be like, oh God. Like John Hughes called that guy the donger at a, at a and that is like not appropriate. Um, so anyway, so like it is, it's a, it, it, I think all creative work is, uh, it, it, it is, 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 uh, is, is, is having faith. And one of the reasons why my 2019 was so bad for the first half is like, I kept having faith and I kept falling on my face and that's what, and, and so I almost had a crisis of faith that like maybe there was no audience for this stuff or maybe like I wasn't good or maybe like, maybe like it was all over. And like, that is when it becomes very hard to continue on as a creative. Mm. Mm. Yeah. It's, 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 it's a tough one, you know, and this, this sort of almost comes across as a, a risk of addiction. So to, as you say, I mean, how, how close to the ground can you get before you actually, you know, you pull the, pull the parachute, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of known, but. Russell, I'm apologies. I think we've gone slightly over time, but um, thank you. Tell us how can people reach out to you? How can they follow you? How can they hunt you down and find you? Sure. Well, the easiest way is to just go to russellnolte.com. You can see all of my work. You can uh, you can uh, you can join our mailing list and get some free books. Um, if you are a creative yourself, you can go to thecompletecreative.com. It's got about 500 blog posts and 200 podcast episodes about how to build a creative career. But you know, I think the complete uh, uh, russellnolte.com is probably the best first stop. And then you can also find and from there, if you join our mailing list, you can find me on Facebook and Instagram and BookBub and all the other places. Awesome. Russell, it's been awesome, actually. I really enjoyed it. So thank you very much. Thank you for having me.